let's uh, take this conversation on digital currency forward with our guest joining us on CC is Ishwar Prasad. He is a professor for economics at the Cornell University, author of the future of money as well, how the digital revolution is transforming currencies and finance. Thank you so much for your time, Ishwar, and welcome to CC. Your first thoughts on what makes this digital currency such a talked about thing, such hot property. And this is one thing that even the governments are very excited about. The interesting thing is that central banks were considering um, how to keep their currencies relevant in a world where digital payments are becoming increasingly the norm. Um, and I think cryptocurrencies have given central banks um, a sort of kick in the pants to get started on this. The motivations for issuing a CBDC differs by country. You spoke about financial inclusion, mm -hmm. bringing more people into the financial system, giving them easy access to digital uh, payments at a low cost. And that's true for a number of developing countries, but there are other motivations at play. In a country like Sweden, where the private sector is providing digital payments very effectively, mm -hmm. the central bank there, the Riksbank, is thinking of issuing an e-kroner largely to serve as the backstop to the private payments infrastructure so that in case of a crisis of confidence or so on, you would have a government pay payment option. And China is an interesting case, as you mentioned, there, much like in India, there are private sector digital payments that are easily available to a lot of the population. But the central bank wants to keep its money relevant at the retail level and not cede the entire payment space to private uh, payment providers. Mm. So there is this range of motivations, but I think the reality is that this is the way the entire world is going. China is undertaking trials as is Sweden. The Bahamas has already rolled out the world's first uh, nationwide digital currency, the sand dollar. Japan is undertaking experiments and uh, um, the Bank of England and the European Central Bank are not far behind. And so is India. So I think the era of cash is drawing to an end. Wow. Era of cash coming to an end. That's a strong statement to make over there. But hold on to the thought about China because there's so much to discuss when it comes to that. Let me also introduce the other guest with us today, Dilip Cherian founder and consulting partner at Perfect Relations, where Dilip, you've seen in various avatars on the channel as well. But today he joins us as an expert and also as an insider because he's part of the Policy 4.0 Advisory Committee and a member of India CBDC Policy Matters as well. Uh, welcome, Dilip, to CC. Thank you. Give us what we don't know about digital currency so far. And, you know, one of the basics that I want to really uh, understand is what do you think will onset or coming in of a digital currency in India due to the already open crypto market? You know, as you said, the two are actually uh, fairly different products and, and different spaces. Uh, what is happening in the crypto market uh, is that, as the professor just said, uh, it has given a kick in the pants to the central bank. They recognize the chances that they are going to become irrelevant is going to be high. But a, a CBDC, by its definition, is not crypto because of the fact that it is still fiat money. And the entire basis on which uh, crypto is created is that we, the people, don't believe the platforms that government has created. And we think that value needs to reside somewhere else in some other method. Second, I think that uh, if you look at what the Chinese yuan is doing and policy 4.0 has worked on it, um, the kind of engineering that has gone into the Chinese CBDC is actually getting it as close to a kind of decentralized, uh, except it's government controlled, uh, as possible to really make it completely digital. But where all of these fail is that, except for the Swedish experiment hmm. and what they are doing, all these also have embedded in them the sense of control by government. Hmm. Government wants to add another layer of big brotherly watching over you, where you spend your cash, are you paying your taxes, how hmm. often are you spending, where do you make your money from, etc. So I think... There is the engineering part, which we mm. need to think mm. about. And I think that the Reserve Bank and others would do well to understand from experts who inevitably will be outside the government domain, 
who understand what the technology and what the implications of this could right. be if it is done badly and what should be done right to make it worthwhile talking about implications let me uh, go back uh, to ishwar on that ishwar so what do you think it will do to things like platforms like paytm or online transactions or upi etc that is also so popular in india now you go to a you know vegetable seller on the road and he is accepting paytm now so the remarkable thing um, is that in countries like china and india which used to be behind in digital payments compared to the advanced economies there is actually less of a user case um, for cbdcs because as you said there are very effective digital payments that are already um, in operation but i think there are other benefits to having a cbdc you talked about how it might help pull economic activity out of the shadows it might um, uh, make it harder to use central bank money for illicit transactions mm. which will certainly be, be benefits but i think the risks need to be kept in mind as well mm. um, one of the forms that a cbdc can take mm. might be um, essentially central bank accounts that are available to households and the technology is now available to make uh, uh, these digital wallets in which cbdcs could be held um accessible to all households um, in an economy and that poses a potential threat of disintermediation of the banking system if people move their deposits to a central bank account believing it to be safer hmm. it could reduce innovation by private sector um, participants in terms of payments um and it also has privacy issues as you mentioned but i think technology is showing us a way around some of these technical as well as conceptual problems china for instance is setting up different grades of cbdc digital wallets if you want to undertake high value transactions you have to provide your identity to a commercial bank or other um institution that can undertake know your customer um uh, regulatory requirements but if you want to use a digital wallet for low value transactions um you can use digital wallets that give you a much greater degree of anonymity i see but certainly the reality mm. is that everything digital ultimately leaves a trace and no central bank wants to have its currency not be auditable and traceable mm. so we're going to have to have these conversations about whether we are ready for cbdc not just from an economic mm. or technocratic perspective mm. but also from a societal perspective because leaving cash behind is going to involve some sacrifices Yeah and you know that's the beauty of it all because if you look at what's happening with digital currency in regard to in the backdrop of crypto and I want Dilip to answer this question as well the the only question that a layman has about crypto today is that it's not regulated government we don't know how it's going to come in on this one and look at the conversation on the other hand when it comes to digital currency government also for being forced in a way to come in and jump on the bandwagon like we said we don't know what tech is going to be involved in this just yet but this actually benefits the government in so many ways so it really opens up a lot of avenues for crypto in india as well sure in fact the biggest advantage of crypto is that it opens up a range of economic innovation that otherwise is not possible because suddenly you have a a fiat currency which is the basis of everything that you're doing digitally hmm. and you know that it is backed by the central bank so uh properly done it could unleash a new wave of entrepreneurship hmm. but as uh, professor ishwar uh, Pras- prasad said that the danger to banks to conventional banks exists we need to be conscious of that hmm. yet is it more worth your while to unleash a new wave of economic entrepreneurship new kinds of payments new options new savings instruments etc mm. which will happen as cbdcs get rolled out mm. and there lies the opportunity for government and it could be as i said a new engine of growth It is indeed, and so much to explore on that front. But for now, Ishwar Dilip, thank you both for joining us in this very fascinating conversation. We'll keep talking about how the rollout is actually going to happen once we get more information on that.